Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see you all. I wonder how many people did put up their hands about the, 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 the lunch. I didn't see, I wasn't looking. Um, but I, I, I'm not completely plastic free. We know that plastics is everywhere. Um, and uh, I hasten to say it's not all on us to solve the problem. But as some of you may know, I spent uh, the best part of a year researching the marine plastic uh, crisis um, to make a program about how bad the problem had got. Um, and I completely over underestimated um, the issue. Uh, it soon became very clear that it was a much bigger problem than I'd first imagined. And um, it propelled me or compelled me to, to find out more about why the obstacles still remain to solving uh, such a crisis. And so I decided to keep on informing myself, trying to find out why um, the problem with marine plastics is so bad. And uh, as a consumer and as a communicator, I feel like it's my job to continue to spread the word so that we can all play a part in being the solution. That's the key for me. It's certainly um, the, the main point that I've learned um, ever since I started finding out about the problem. Ever since back in the 70s, scientists were saying, you know, large-scale production of plastics is going to create an environmental hazard if we don't do something about it now. And that was back in the 70s. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program very quickly and then sort of what I've learned since making that program um, about where the solutions lie and why we're not solving this problem quickly enough. So plastic is everywhere. It's reached every corner of our blue planet. And in the middle of the Tasman Sea is a little island called Lord Howe Island. And around Lord Howe, flesh-footed shearwaters um, pick off bits of plastic out of the water column, mistaking it for food, and then they feed it to their little chicks that live in the burrows for three months of their lives before they emerge to take off on their maiden voyage, their maiden migration north to the Sea of Japan. And every year, every April, a group of dedicated scientists go to Lord Howe, and in the middle of the night, because this is when the chicks emerge, they, they grab these little chicks who are emerging for the first time after three months of being fed religiously with plastic, every instinct telling them, it's time for me to migrate, but their bellies are full of plastic, not squid, not seafood that they need in order to have enough energy to migrate. So the scientists give them a health check, and that includes uh, washing out their stomach, flushing out their stomachs with a sterile seawater. So we joined the scientists for three of those nights, and what we found was in every little belly of these three-month-old chicks was plastic. 30 pieces in one, 40 pieces in another was, were coming out of the little chicks' bellies. And of the birds that they can't get to in the night because it's pitch black and all the little birds are moving along the, the little sandy path making their way to the sea. They do a sweep on the beaches the next day. So we joined them for one of those in the morning and on a stretch of beach not much bigger than the stretch of the, the width of this stage were four dead shearwater chicks. They simply didn't have enough energy, enough nutrition to allow them to take off over the surf and, and take off and take flight. And we took them back to the lab and we carried out a post-mortem and this is what we found. Lots of pieces of plastic inside their stomachs. And can you believe that the scientists have found as many as 260 pieces of plastic inside a three-month-old shearwater chick, and that's actually quite common. That equates to a human being, like you or me, having 10 kilos of plastic inside their stomachs. And the problems sort of are not only about the mechanical obstruction in the stomachs. The problems are that we now know that chemicals are used to make this plastic, and we well, scientists know that these chemicals leach into the environment and leach in the bodies of animals. So now the scientists are studying, well, how much is too much? Even if a bird has one piece of plastic in its stomach and it's able to migrate, how will that piece of plastic affect its reproduction? Because these chemicals are known to be endocrine disruptors, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. Um, and they're toxic. They're toxic in the blood. And so that's what the scientists are studying now with very little funding and very little support, which makes my heart ache when this is clearly such an important issue. 
So after Lord Howe, we went to the Arctic. Now the Arctic and the Antarctic were once considered to be the most pristine places on our blue planet, untouched by pollution, surely, and surely plastic doesn't reach the Arctic. But actually, we now know that concentrations of microplastics, so this is small pieces of plastic, anything uh, smaller than about uh, one, five millimeters is, is classified as a microplastics, but it's kind of a loose classification. And we know now, that there are some of the highest concentrations of microplastics in the Arctic. So we joined some scientists there who are looking at how, how much are microplastics infiltrating the food web there. So we know already, science has already shown us, if you see the little creatures over on the top left corner with little green glowy bits, what scientists have done is they've marked microplastics with fluorescent biomarkers and they've watched little creatures called zooplankton ingest the microplastics. Now, zooplankton are little creatures at the very bottom of the food web in the ocean. They, they kickstart the entire food web. They are absolutely vital for life in our oceans and all life on Earth, because a healthy ocean means a healthy planet. So scientists already know that zooplankton are taking in microplastics. They already know that mussels, all mussels sampled, including in the Arctic, are, as they filter feed zooplankton, they're ingesting these microplastic bits that you can see there underneath the picture of the mussels. All mussels have microplastics in them, that much we know. So when we joined Amy Lusher and her team in the Arctic, we had to wait until those magnificent beasts, those walruses, what they do is they haul out. They're, they're, they, despite their huge size, they actually burrow for clams and mussels. They eat shellfish predominantly. And every now and then, after a big bout of feeding, they, they haul out. This is what's called a haul out site, and a haul out site, and they rest before they go back to feed again. So we have to wait until they're ready to go back hunting, and then we move in quickly into the haul out site and we collect their poo and we bring the poo back to the lab, and we analyze the poo, and we look for any signs of plastic. And we did indeed find microplastics in the walruses' feces, which means that microplastics are moving from the zooplankton up to the mussels, up to the walruses. And that's only one chain of a ginormous food web in the Arctic. We now know that the Arctic marine food web has been completely swamped with microplastics. So we're talking little zooplankton to shellfish to fish, for example, the polar cod, and then to a seal, and then to a human, or zooplankton to cod to a seal to a polar bear. And note that humans are involved in this Arctic marine food web. And the repercussions of this are only beginning to be investigated, okay? We still don't fully know how plastics are affecting animals, but what's clear is that for many decades now, these food webs have been ingesting microplastics, and the microplastics is, are bioaccumulating as they move up the web. Every next predator is getting more and more plastic, and we still don't fully know how that's affecting the health of these incredible and very important animals. So the full scope of the destructive power of plastics is still being unraveled. We next went to the Coral Triangle. It's home to half of the world's coral reefs, an incredibly important ecosystem um, that's already under tremendous pressure from climate change, from global warming. We know that coral reefs are bleaching. Um, they're losing their little um, algae that they need to make food. Um, and so when the algae leave the corals, the corals turn white. And on the reefs around the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia, Jolie Lam and her team, well, that's me, but she has a big team of scientists as well, are diving around the coral reefs to see just how much plastic is around the coral reefs. And she sees that, you know, the plastic is already breaking the corals, it's obstructing the growth of the corals, it's already blocking out the light as it settles on top of it. So think about big fishing nets, um, big plastic sacking, all that kind of stuff. And it's already, uh, she knows, sort of blocking out the oxygen that the corals need to thrive. But what she's discovered is that bits of plastic are also acting like little disease-carrying rafts. Plastic isn't completely smooth, it's got a lot of nooks and crannies. And bacteria that are found naturally in the environment, so there's also bacteria found naturally in the oceans, proliferate on these little rafts. They concentrate and they grow in great concentrations on these bits of plastic. And then the plastic, as it settles on the coral, will deliver this toxic load of bacteria onto the coral. 
and the coral will then spread across, or sorry, the, the, the bacteria will spread across the coral, leaving a band of, of white dead coral in its wake. So one particular bacteria called um, Vibrio, which is in the same group of bacteria um, as those that cause cholera in humans, yeah, it leaves a disease called white band disease because, as you can see, as it spreads across the coral, a bit like gangrene spreads across skin, it leaves dead tissue in its wake. That was one of the most surprising and horrifying aspects of, of how plastics affect uh, the marine environment because already corals are under so, so much stress, the last thing they need is yet another another threat. And Jolie and her team have so far studied about 125,000 different corals. And what she's found is, in the presence of plastic, the risk of disease increases from 4% to a whopping 89%. So again, this is quite shocking new revelatory information about just how much plastic can damage our environment. So when it comes to where all this plastic is coming from? Well, we know that one garbage truck load of plastic enters the sea every single minute, every minute, a whole garbage truck load. And that hasn't stopped, by the way. Ever since Blue Planet 2 and Sir David Attenborough really dealt with this topic, we called it the Blue Planet Effect. Ever since I was sent to make this program to investigate just how bad the problem has gotten, which is three, four years ago now, the same amount, if not more, of the plastic is entering our oceans. So it equates to about 8 million tons of plastic entering our oceans every year. 8 million tons. And half of that comes from our rivers. Now, we've got, of the 10 most polluted rivers in the world, we've got eight of them in Southeast Asia. So we decided to stick around Indonesia and go to the island of Java and have a look at a river called the Chitterum. So that's a picture of the Chitterum there. This is the first day when we arrived at the river. This is what we saw. I'm, I'm sorry it's blurry. That's my terrible picture off my phone, I think. Um, and we saw a raft of plastic and other waste a mile long. We had to send a drone up into the air to film it, just, just to see just how long it was, stretching from bank to bank, moving its way slowly towards the sea. And at our feet were these fish that fish circled in red there. There are a lot of um, filter fish species in these rivers. Their role is to keep the rivers clean, but they're all floating belly up on the banks of the river. And the worst bit of it all was these guys in their fishing boats. These are fishermen who used to fish these rivers to put food on the table for their livelihoods. But fish populations have plummeted by um, over, let me get this right, over 60% in the last 20 years. So when I interviewed the, the guy in the first boat there, one of the hardest interviews I've ever had to do, when he's explaining to me, you know, I can't, I can't be a fisherman anymore. I've got to pick dirty bits of plastic out of that mess and try and sell that plastic so that I can put food on the table. So when it comes to where all this plastic then is coming from again. You know, you keep on tracing it back from the sea to the rivers. You quickly end up in the markets of Indonesia where everything, they have a lot of stalls in all these villages, in all these markets, and everything is wrapped in, in plastic from, from food to clothes to household goods. Everything is wrapped in plastic. Most notably of all are these sachets, strips of sachets thousands upon thousands of strips of sachets. And they're packaging for everything from shampoo to toothpaste to, to soup powders to coffee granules. And what this is doing is making these everyday goods affordable to people in developing countries who can't afford to buy big containers of things. But they want to enjoy the goods that we have been taking for granted um, for decades now here in the West. And why shouldn't they? But the problem is, Every villager we spoke to said to me, our local government doesn't support any waste management, any recycling. We are actually, in fact, told to just deal with our own waste ourselves. There's no collection whatsoever. So what do they do? They make these makeshift landfill sites, dumps, at the back of their houses. And inevitably, in these villages, the back of your home always borders the river. And they try and burn some of it. They try to control some of it and dampen it down. And, and we, we worked on a landfill site where they were, we were trying to clear it and there were layers upon layers of plastic deep in the earth. But ultimately, the plastic ends up in the river. That's the Chitterum. 
and it ends up going out to sea. But the local governments aren't the only people being blamed for this problem. The global brands that supply these sachets to developing countries, sort of identifying a new economic niche, okay, these people can't afford big bottles, we know, let's make some sachets and sell it to them that way so we can make money in these countries. They know full well that they're, they're providing these sachets to places that have no waste management to speak of, okay? And knowing the scale of the crisis in our oceans, surely they have a responsibility to take care of this. Now, some brands have said, by 2025, we promise we're going to make everything recyclable, we're going to collect these sachets and recycle them ourselves. But what's the point of making a sachet recyclable when you know you're in a country that has, never mind a recycling infrastructure, it doesn't even have a waste collection infrastructure. So the problem is quite multi-layered, as you can imagine, but it's certainly something that the global brands need to take responsibility for. And the fact is that two billion people globally don't have a waste management system to speak of. But if we think, so when the program went out, a lot of people on social media said to me, well, this is hideous. This is Southeast Asia's problem. They're the worst polluters in the world. They're the ones to blame. We've got to sort that out. They've got to sort their problem out. It's not our problem. But actually, that couldn't be further from the truth. So let me give you an example of the three million tons of plastic packaging collected in the UK alone every year. Three million tons. Only 9% is recycled. Now, when I say recycled in inverted commas, I mean that that, act that actual amount of plastic, just 9% of the 3 million tons a year, is actually downcycled for the most part, which means that the plastic uh, is used to make lower grade plastic items like park benches or flower pots or carpet backing. And more new virgin plastic has to come into the system to make that bottle or make that food packaging all over again. In any case, 9% of our plastic here in the UK is recycled. 50% of it is sent either to landfill or it's incinerated. And the rest, so roughly about 30, 40%, where do you think it goes? You've seen the headlines, surely, by this, by this point, but let me just remind you. It goes to Indonesia, it goes to Malaysia, and it goes to Vietnam. Our plastic waste goes to developing countries that have very high waste mismanagement rates. So for example, in Malaysia, they have an 86% waste mismanagement rate. And Malaysia is currently the biggest importer of our dirty plastic. Exports to Malaysia from the UK increased in May of this year, knowing what we know. And a recent report discovered that much of this plastic sits on these illegal dump sites in Malaysia and other countries in developing countries. And they try and burn it, which causes serious environmental issues for the villagers that live around the dump sites. But ultimately, it just sits there. Where does it end up? In the rivers and ultimately into the sea. And they found bags from the UK, from Ireland, from France, from Germany, from Japan, from Australia. So this is clearly a global issue. We are all responsible for the plastic that ends up in our oceans. And the government in this country has admitted that it won't meet the targets next year to recycle, inverted commas, half of our household weights. They've already admitted, no, we're not going to meet those targets. When the Britain was, was selling its dirty plastic weights to China up until two years ago, until China closed its doors, at that point, we all thought, OK, finally, the West is going to have to wake up to this problem. They can't just fob off the problem to a developing country, well, not China, but you know what I mean, to another country that's going to deal with the, with the plastic waste. We're going to have to pull up our socks and finally deal with our recycling, finally deal with our plastic waste. What did they do instead? They just found other countries with worst waste management infrastructure to deal with the plastic. I mean, for me, that's absolutely shocking. And unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a science presenter, but with, for somebody who's now communicating issues about the environment, it very quickly gets political. So I'm sorry if I'm giving you sort of almost equally a political talk as a science talk, but that's, that's the story these days when it comes to environmental issues. And it's really woken me up and put a, put a fire in my belly, which is why I want to share what I've learned with you uh, today. So uh, globally, of the 8.3 billion tons of plastics that have been manufactured to date, to date, 
91% hasn't been recycled, and again, that means downcycled, but 91% hasn't been dealt with. So the point I'm trying to make here is this is not Southeast Asia's problem. This is undoubtedly a global problem. And predictions are that by 2025, ocean plastic will have trebled. In six years' time, ocean plastic will have trebled. So as the scale of the plastic manufacturing juggernaut and the, and the, the global lack of, of proper waste management becomes apparent, Here's a, bit of, here's a bit of hope. People all around the world are trying to take things into their own hands and solve the problem themselves. From the general public, the UK has been brilliant, by the way, in this regard, um, to, to inventors and scientists and just individuals who just want to get on with it and find solutions. So um, on, the, on the upper left there, there's a, um, a Baltimore wheel. It was designed by just two gentlemen in America who decided to do something about trying to clean up the plastic in the rivers before it enters our oceans. So this wheel runs um, on the flow of the water at the estuaries and also runs on solar powered, it's got solar powered panels on it. And just the flow of the water may, allows the plastic to go up the conveyor belt and it collects all the plastic. And since it was deployed in Baltimore Harbor in 2014, it's collected, let me get these figures right because it's quite impressive, one million plastic bottles, and I'm sure that's increased by now, half a million plastic bags, and 11 million cigarette butts. Because remember, cigarette butts are made of plastic fibers. So it's doing really well. This bright young spark over here on the left-hand corner, his name is Fionn Ferreira. He comes from County Cork in Ireland, and he's 18 years old, and he just won the Google Science Prize this year for inventing something called a magnetic liquid to pick up microplastics from all sorts of water, including wastewater. So basically, he made it himself. He found um, that if you use magnetite, which is an iron ore found naturally in the earth, and he makes it into powder, and you combine it with vegetable oil, and he says that McDonald's waste oil is brilliant for the job, so look at him being sustainable. You combine the two together, you've got this magnetic liquid. And in chemistry, like attracts like, so the plastic is attracted to the oil, then you've got this kind of gloopy, plasticky, iron ore magnety stuff in wastewater, and all you have to do is use a magnet, and it lifts the oily magnetic liquid with the plastic attached out of the water. And he says it would be really, really efficient for getting microplastics out of household water, business, industry water, because microplastics is everywhere. Uh, they're in our water as well. So I think he's extraordinary. He's a bright young mind who's just getting on with it himself and finding solutions. When it comes to the plastic that unfortunately has bypassed the river stage and the wastewater stage and is in the oceans, well, you know what? Great Britain, Scandinavia, and a few other countries around the world have just galvanized. The general public have been extraordinary. You are organizing beach cleans everywhere, and it's a heroic effort. Um, every time a plastic tide washes up, you're out there cleaning the plastic. For the plastic that's already far out at sea, there's a young man called Boyan Slat, again, like very young, very bright, I think he's about 24, but at the age of 12, when he was scuba diving in Greece, he saw this plastic, and from the age of 12, he was just thinking to himself, I'm going to have to be a part of the solution. It's breaking my heart what I'm seeing. So by the age of 23, 24, he had amassed a, a team of 100 bright minds, engineers, scientists, environmentalists, and he'd raised a lot of money himself without waiting for the government to support him. And he designed this thing called the Ocean Cleanup System. And it's designed to, it's a big sort of boy, uh, a kind of um, a big tube with a skirt underneath that's designed to flow working with nature, working with the ocean currents to pick up plastic. And the first system was deployed last September of last year, but it didn't work quite well, so he brought it back in, his team retested it, redesigned it, and it's now out in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, successfully collecting plastic. Now, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is this area three times the size of France that's thought to have 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic in it. And it's because there's a system of currents that brings all of the plastic together. They're called gyres. And there are three, there are five, I should say, gyres around the world. And he's trying to concentrate on that one. He's trying to clean that one by 50% every five years. Now, the system and Boyan have actually been criticized 
by the scientific community and by others for looking at the problem in the wrong way, for trying to clean up the mess instead of spending that money on stopping the plastic from getting into the ocean in the first place. And, and they've got a valid point. There's also some criticism about the fact that the system could be also collecting, as it collects the plastic, uh, a layer on the surface of the water called the Newston, which is a very important um, ecosystem, a marine ecosystem. Um, but he, he is constantly revisiting, constantly retesting, constantly making sure that the impact is minimal, and I think he has to be celebrated for that. And what's most important is he just didn't believe in the perceived wisdom that nothing could be done about the plastic out in the ocean in the first place. He thought, we're going to have to approach this from all sorts of angles. I'm going to pick this one, and I'm going to try and make a difference. I don't want the big bits of plastic to break up into small microplastics and then to infiltrate the food web, as it does in the Arctic. And I think for that, yeah. He should really be celebrated. Um, and most you know, importantly as well, he just doesn't wait for legislation or for governments or for industry to do something. He got off his you know what and he did it himself. So I think he's fantastic. Um, so, sorry, bear with me. I'm showing somebody my notes so they've gone all over the place. Here we go. They're all back to front. Um, the problem, though, as much as all of these efforts are, are valiant and important and should be celebrated, is it feels to me a bit like sticking a finger in a dam. You know, you're cleaning up all this mess, but the mess keeps coming. And the big problem here is that the plastic really does keep coming. At the moment, we're making globally 400 million tons of plastic every year, and that's set to increase to 800 million tons by 2040. Okay? So in America alone, petrochemical uh, industries are investing um, a heck of a lot of money. $200 billion are being invested currently to increase production of plastic by 40% in the next decade. And in the States, it's predominantly due to fracking. There's a big fracking boom in the States. We all know what fracking is, right? Collecting gas from the rocks by shaking up the rocks by, again, interfering with nature. So shale gas and shale gas liquid, which is a starting material for plastics, is super cheap in the States at the moment. It's super cheap to make plastic. And so they're making this plastic or they're selling the raw materials, this shale, this shale gas liquid. They're shipping it all across uh, America to, for other factories to make plastic. They're also shipping it to the UK, to Europe, and to China. So growth is on the rise. The industry is still making more plastic. And with this ever-increasing production comes this often overlooked impact uh, that plastic has, and that is on climate change, the carbon footprint of plastic production is something like 15% of all of our global greenhouse gas emissions, 15%. And that's because at every stage of the plastic manufacturing process, there's a massive carbon footprint. The first is 99% of all plastics are made from fossil fuels, 99%. So you're talking about the extraction of fossil fuels already, huge carbon footprint. To make plastic, massive carbon footprint. You need a lot of energy. Now, that's not to say that other materials don't have a carbon footprint, but you've got to add all of this up to see just how much plastic is impacting. And even at the end of its life, you either incinerate the plastic or actually even when it ends up in the sea, the ocean then can't carry out its really important carbon sink function. Just like tropical forests, the ocean acts as a carbon storage, a natural solution to our climate change issues. So if you put plastic in there and you mess up the entire ecosystem by animals ingesting it, by plastic delivering toxic loads of bacteria to the corals, the ocean can't function properly and it can't be the carbon store that we need it to be. So again, carbon footprint goes up. And when the arguments between industry and environmentalists are being sort of debated, Oftentimes, the industry is not talking about all of these impacts. They're talking about the impact of a cotton bag. Cotton is environmentally costly as well, but they're not talking about the total cost of making plastic, just how big a carbon footprint that is. And when plastic is uh, made, raw materials 
have additives put into it, so chemicals, to make the plastics behave in a way that we want them to behave. So if you're talking about a rigid, clear bottle, you, ne you need a, a chemical called a bisphenol, most usually bisphenol A, B BPA, but there are other bisphenols. If you want cling film over your food, you need to use a chemical called phthalates that makes the film, well, makes plastic sort of flexible and malleable and easy to handle. Now, both of these groups of chemicals are known to be endocrine disruptors, so they really mess your hormones, mess up your hormones, which means hormones are in implicated in every thing in your body. So if your hormones aren't functioning properly, your biochemistry isn't functioning properly, that creates a lot of problems. They're also connected to hormone-mediated cancers, like breast cancer. And then they're also known to be toxic to reproduction. So they can be toxic to your reproductive system, whether you're a male or female. They can cause um, toxicity to the fetus during development in pregnancy. And they're also associated with birth defects. These are pretty nasty chemicals that are used during the plastic manufacturing process. And we know that they leach out. We now can show that they leach out of plastics into the environment or they leach into the bodies of the animals that feed on them. To add insult to injury, as if this wasn't enough to be telling you, um, a lot of the scientists we spoke to when we were making the program started investigating the marine plastic problem. But many of them very quickly turned to airborne plastic particles. In, in fact, one scientist, Stephanie Wright, who we interviewed, was, that was exactly her story. Well, I started looking at the ocean plastic, but very quickly, very quickly turned my attention to airborne particles. And the way she put it to me has stayed with me forever. She said, if you decide to eat mussels, as I still do sometimes, there are going to be more plastics that you ingest through the air that you breathe and the dust that settles on the mussels than are in the mussels themselves. So when she told me that, this is why I was like a dog with a bone, I can't leave this alone. I need to find out why it's so bad, why it's so prevalent, and why we haven't solved this problem still to this day. So scientists are also saying that these chemicals, when they're combined inside a living system, their harmful effects are increased, and that we've severely underestimated just how bad that can be. So when I was told by this incredible organization called A Plastic Planet, that the first human health plastic summit was going to be held in Amsterdam, I immediately begged to go along. And they said, yeah, you can come along, but would you like to take a urine test to see how many phthalates and bisphenols you have in your system? And then would you like to announce it at the conference? So I went to the summit, this was only two weeks ago, and research on human health and plastics is, is drastically underfunded. Which, which just blows my mind. I would have thought that was the, would be such a, a priority when it comes to you know, our environmental issues. So the, the, and also science has to take, it does take time, as you well know, because you're all, you're all here because you understand it. So it takes a little bit of time to get in, you know, results. But the initial results are coming out about plastics, and it's all pointing to some pretty serious things, like microplastics reaching the fetus in development through the placenta like immune cells. Our immune cells die three times faster in the presence of plastic than without. So you can imagine the repercussions. If your body can't fight disease because it's been killed by plastic and the toxic chemicals in it, that's going to be um, something that we really need a lot more research on. And also, one scientist said, it's only a matter of time before we prove that microplastics are in our blood. So it was an exciting yet sobering summit. Um, and then I took the urine test for the conference, and I have to be honest with you, I was really keen to do it. I was like, give me the jar, let's do this. Of course, we've all got these chemicals in our systems. I want to be part of the solution, so I want to show that it's in there, uh, that I've got some of these chemicals, and then we can just get on with using that information to create the change that we need. But actually, when I read the results, I did really take stock, and it was really scary and very sobering, because I saw the reality of what life in the West and how we live our lives and what we wrap our food in is doing to my body. So I had a whole lot of phthalates, different ones. I won't go through the list. Anyway, it's quite blurry. You can't see it, but it's all these chemical names, so don't worry. And a whole lot of bisphenols. And three of them in particular, BPA and two types of phthalates, are on the substances of very high concern uh, list of the European Chemical Agency. I have them in my body. 
And the science is saying that the main source of this exposure, although we're being exposed to it in the air we breathe, is through our diet. So bisphenols is because the liquids in the bottles um, that we drink, the food that we eat in the containers, the wrapping in our supermarkets, all of that is leaching this chemical and it's ending up in my body. And when it comes to phthalates, it's the same thing. Cling films, all sorts of PVC, it's everywhere. It's getting into my body. And I'm exposed to these chemicals and then I excrete them, right? So they pass through your body quite quickly. They're doing their harm in your body for a short space of time. But the problem is I'm exposed to it constantly. So the harmful effect is continuous, right? And now that I know that I have them in my body and that they're affecting my reproductive system, that they're affecting my hormones, that they could potentially play a role in, in cancers in my life, I'm angry. And I don't understand why we're still in this position now that we know what we know. And the thing that makes me most angry of all is the plastic keeps coming. I told you about the graph is literally like this, right? Now, it's important at this point to say that not all plastic, after, after everything I've said, you know, this damning account of plastics, not all plastics are this material to be condemned. Some plastics are incredibly important for saving lives. They're used in MRI machines and in lots of medical equipment. They're used in the aeronautics industry. You know, they're, they're important plastics. Now, the question about how they're disposed of at the end of life are very important questions to ask. But here's the crux. 40% of all the plastic that's made is this single-use plastic packaging, use once, throw it away. This is the stuff that we could be tackling right now, and this is the stuff that causes us to have toxic chemicals in our bodies. We know that. We've all, we're connecting the dots at a fierce rate right now, but still, plastic packaging is everywhere in our supermarkets. So it's um, clear that we need solutions on the scale that match the scale of this issue. Right, we're getting into solutions here and what we can all do to be part of uh, the solutions this planet needs. Lots of people are calling for better management of the plastic in, in operation, the, the, even the plastic packaging. So in other words, collect it properly and then make sure that you've made this plastic in such a way that it can be recycled over and over again. Well, there's two problems with that. Any plastic at the moment, even if you change its composition a little bit to have hopefully less toxic chemicals, can really only be re recycled a finite number of times before it's rendered useless. Um, the other thing is we have no recycling infrastructure to speak of, not only in this country, but globally. So very quickly, it, made, it was very, very clear to me that recycling is not going to get us out of this mess, right? The other thing is that um, they're, they're saying Greenpeace and the Environmental Investigation Agency are saying even if we made packaging you know, recyclable, no recycling facility in the world could handle the volume of packaging we are still using. So that we have to look away from recycling and look to refill, reuse, glass jars, etc. That that really is the solution. And in the meantime, we should also be looking for alternative materials. So some of them are, they're made from bamboo and they're made from wood and they're made from seaweed and they're made from hemp. But many of these bioplastics that are deemed compostable can't actually just be put, be put on your compost heap at home in your backyard. They're still made with certain chemicals that mean that they need certain conditions for them to be composted. So in other words, they need industrial composting facilities. Now, we have industrial composting facilities in the UK. None of them accept these materials. They just want food. It's too expensive, it's not economically viable, they just don't want it. And 150 or so of our facilities are set to shut down anyway because we don't actually collect food separately to the rest of our waste. So again, it's a problem and it's a solution that can't be implemented straight away because we just don't have the infrastructure to work it properly, to manage it properly. So again, environmentalists are calling for a different solution, a different way of living that solves this inordinate amount of packaging that we seem to want to have on everything, whether it's recyclable plastic or it's a different material. In the meantime, though, another young bright mind has come up with a solution that doesn't call for composting on an, on an industrial level. His name is David Christian. He lives in Indonesia, one of the worst polluting countries in the world, mind you, with our contribution as well, it has to be said. But he and two other people decided, right, come on, let's, let's find a way, let's find a solution. So he designed seaweed packaging, chemical-free, nothing toxic, 
that dissolves completely in water and is completely harmless to the ecosystem and to our bodies, okay? Now, this packaging has a shelf life of two years, so it can't be used for everything, but it can revolutionize two areas of industries, I think. I actually tasted one in, um, you know, it, it houses coffee granules, for example, or soup stocks, uh, snack bars, and I tasted a coffee that came out of the sachet, you know, you just dissolve the whole sachet of coffee in hot water, it doesn't taste of seaweed, it doesn't smell of seaweed, it's brilliant. But really what dawned on me was, think about the toiletries in hotels, those stupid little soaps wrapped in a plastic film in a plastic box. Imagine if they were wrapped in a sachet like this made of seaweed, right? Shelf life of two years, perfect, because there's a really quick turnaround on these products in, in hotel rooms. And all you do is you dissolve the plastic, sorry, the seaweed sachet under hot water and you've got your soap. Genius. Also, hamburgers wrapped in seaweed packaging. Of course, the most uh, uh, nutritious part of that meal is the seaweed wrapper. Obviously, it's got loads of minerals, so actually it's a bonus. But that, again, could transform the fast food industry, which goes through tons and tons and tons of, you know, even if it's wrapped in paper, it's got a plastic film on it. So don't kid yourselves, that's still plastic. So I think he's incredible. Again, he should be celebrated. And if only the industry and our world leaders could just take example from these bright young minds, we'd be a lot closer to solving this problem. So aside from amazing young individuals like Chris, like David, and like Boyan, and like Fionn, we know that experts are saying we need to turn away from packaging altogether. We need to rethink how we live. So how can we achieve the change that's needed? Really rethink how we consume. Well, I have to celebrate the UK and Scandinavia. You should be all really proud of yourselves because more so than many countries in the world, you're doing a lot more to change your plastic habits, and you've led by example. You know, you don't want straws anymore. I don't go anywhere with that, with my reusable coffee cup and my reusable water bottle now. And if I forget my coffee cup, unless I'm in a restaurant, tough, I won't have a coffee that day. That's a change you can make today that can make a huge difference to the amount of plastic consumed. Imagine if each one of you in this room did that starting today. Not, no longer using plastic cutlery, plastic plates, changing your toiletries. I came across something really great on um, social media. This child posted this thing called a plastic audit that they had learned to do in school and she had brought it home to her family. And basically, you collect all your plastic recycling in a bag and at the end of each month, you do a simple bar chart and you separate out the plastic and you go, this is all toiletries, this is all food, this is all miscellaneous, this is all sort of school equipment that came in packaging. And whichever bar is the highest that month, you work on lowering that bar. So for me, it inspired me to look at toiletries. My toiletries is always the highest, actually. And I changed my deodorant to a pl uh, from a plastic one to a cardboard tube. They also come in these little tins. And I changed my... Dental floss, because I hadn't actually really thought dental floss is made of plastic, but now there's also dental floss that isn't. So imagine if you all did that today, and maybe every month, every two months, you know, you decided on changing one more thing in your household. So I really recommend you looking at that. Support organizations that get results. It's really woken me up to the scale of the problem. I follow a plastic planet on Twitter. They're extraordinary. They're the ones who invited me to the uh, health conference in Amsterdam. So, you know, if you follow one or check their website every now and then, you'll become much more informed about how you each can make, make a difference. Um, I'm gonna go to the, the bottom one first and then the one there because that, that last one is my favorite. So the other thing that's really great, and I know Hugh Fernie Whittingstall spoke about it on his series, is I like organic produce. Now, the big question is, of course, if all this organic produce is in plastic packaging, is it organic anymore? I'm actually going to write uh, to Dutchy um, Organics and ask them that, because I don't think they can claim that their food is organic when it's wrapped in plastic. In any case, I'm trying to be healthier, so I'll buy the organic cauliflower, but it's in a plastic bag. So, I'll bring it home, or if it's not too busy in the supermarket, I would, with a big smile on my face, I'll just give the packaging back customer service or at the till, and they're bound to take it off you. They have to take it off you. Imagine if every single one of us did that starting today. It's a really big message to say, we don't want your plastic anymore. You want my feedback as a customer? Here it is. And I really encourage you to do that starting today. And most of the staff just smile at you. They know exactly why, and they're like, come on, give it here. I understand. I would do the same. So imagine 
One thing that you could do starting, starting today, well, tomorrow, because you're here now. Um, this is my favorite one. We need to make our voices heard even more than that, right? There's this gap between our plastic habits and how much of a change that can do, and that can make to the world, and what's happening at a higher level. You know what I'm talking about. I never knew until I watched Knock Down the House, which, by the way, you should all watch. Have you seen Knock Down the House on Netflix? It's about four women who ran for Congress in the States, and one of them, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who's uh, with Greta Thunberg, you know, she's my hero at the moment. She ran for Congress with no corporate funding. What do you mean, no corporate funding? You're going to run for office without the oil industry paying for your campaign? How must that work? And how much of a difference will it make to you as a leader in my country or in my constituency? So for me, there's a massive gap between what policy is doing and what we want. So a start is to write a template letter on your computer to your MP asking for a ban on exports of our plastic waste to Malaysia or asking for a ban on single-use plastics as soon as possible. None of this incremental change, tokenism, greenwashing talk. And press send every week. And you'll get a letter back saying, thank you for your letter. We're taking it very seriously. Yes, we're considering what you're saying. Until you see the change, keep pressing send. That's how we make our voices heard. We have a lot more clout than I thought. I always thought there's only so much we can do, too much of the onus is on the public when I was starting this journey. But now I understand that we have a lot more clout than we think. But there's no point sitting here feeling despair and going home tomorrow or tonight and not thinking that we can do more because each of us, it's only press send. You write the letter and then you press send and that's it. So it's not a lot of effort, but my gosh, the change it could create would be incredible. So the public action in this country is great. Scandinavia is great, but I'm afraid to say around the rest of the world, first of all, in developing countries, they don't have the luxury of being able to afford an alternative material like we do. They simply can't afford it. And then in countries like America, there is no awareness about plastic whatsoever. I was filming in America um, during Valentine's Day, and there was this ad for Burger King, and it was, you know, this young couple, and he was taking her to Burger King, and it was terribly romantic. And there were two, they were sitting across from each other, gazing into each other's eyes, and there were two ginormous Coca-Cola drinks with their plastic lids, and two huge jumbo-sized red with a heart plastic straws. And it was, you know, celebrating Valentine's Day, and I sat there, you know, this was only, you know, a couple of months ago, going, have we learned nothing? This is still being advertised. It's the norm in many countries. So it's clear that more has to happen. At the retail stage, a bit is happening. We have plastic-free aisles popping up in certain countries. Amsterdam was the first. There's one in uh, Budgeons up in North London. Morrison's have launched um, fruit and veg-free aisles in some of their stores. Uh, Waitrose did a refill trial in Oxford. A trial. I don't understand why they're trialing all these things. Just do it already. But at least retail is beginning to show some movement. But just for me, it's, it's painfully, painfully slow. So at the retail level, different things are happening. At a country level, different things are happening. So I'll give you a couple of examples. In the UK, it was announced this year, earlier this year, okay, we're going to tax, I have to talk about this slowly because even I don't understand it. We're going to have to tax any packaging that has less than 30% recycled plastic in it. What's wrong with that sentence? We know the problem with recycling. We know that we can't recycle anyway. What's the point of making a bottle with just 30%? Okay, to get away from the tax, you just make 31% recycled plastic, and then the rest is virgin plastic coming from the petrochemical industry, right? So why can't you just tax anything that isn't 100% recycled plastic that's been made in a new way so it can be recycled again into the same bottle? Do you see what I mean? I don't understand this incremental tokenism. At least that's what it looks like to me. Costa Rica, meanwhile, is banning all single-use plastic by 2021. Why can't we do that? Uh, we've been talking about a, a, a bottle deposit scheme, return scheme in this country for years, and we're still discussing it. And DEFRA put out this thing on social media. We'd like to know how you would like your bottle deposit return scheme to work. Scandinavia has been doing it for decades. It's working beautifully. And Sweden last year had the biggest return ever. So we know how it works. We don't need to tell the government how to do it. 
just follow the example from countries that are doing it already. So you can see the disparity between different countries, and that for me is infuriating. And the thing is, plastic knows no borders in the sea, does it? So it's no use Costa Rica banning single-use plastics, and here in the UK, oh, we're still shipping some of ours to Indonesia, and you know, it ends up in the sea. How is that going to help our oceans? How is that going to help our environment? So it's, it's clear we need a more of a, a uniform, global initiative to solve this problem. So on that note, the European Parliament this year has said we're going to... This headline is actually a bit misleading, by the way. Passes single-use plastic ban. It's in discussion for 2021, I think, but it's only a few things. It's like stirrers and cutlery and straws. It's not everything. It's not all single-use plastic, so that's, that, to me, is quite misleading. Um, and then the G20 members, the big, powerful countries that are trying to solve the world's problems, this is really interesting. Uh, I have to read it out carefully. They, they agreed this year to create an international framework in which members take voluntary steps to reduce plastic pollution in the ocean. So it's voluntary, it's not legally binding. Uh, the US didn't sign it. There's no numerical goal to it. And it's about cleaning up the plastic in the ocean. It's about putting the finger in the dam again, right? It's not about slashing production of plastics to start with. So again, for me, that's not enough. And this is my absolute favorite. Have any of you heard about the Alliance to End Plastic Waste? They did a big, big ad about, we're the alliance to end plastic waste. We're made up of 30 members, made up of petrochemical companies like Dow Chemical, ExxonMobil, and consumer goods manufacturers like Procter & Gamble. Now, this is exciting. They discussed a plan to invest $1.5 billion to rid the environment of plastic. $1.5 billion, that's a lot of money. Except that if you keep reading on their website or you keep reading articles, the petrochemical companies that make up this alliance, each of them are spending tens of billions of dollars each in new petrochemical factories, right? 1.5 billion collectively between the 30 of them versus tens of billion each just, let's keep on making the factories, lads. Let's keep on making the plastic. It makes my blood boil. The plastic keeps coming, so. Where does that leave us? What needs to happen? In the words of Greta Thunberg, why are we not acting as if the house was on fire? We can see what's happening to our oceans. Our animals are dying, the ocean's health is faltering, which means that our health inevitably with, will falter. We know now what plastic is doing to our health. I know I have toxic plastic chemicals in my body as I speak. And we also know that plastic's impact on the climate change crisis is far, far greater than the industry would like us to know. So when it comes to finding the solutions, all too often the first question I hear from recycling or from the plastics uh, packaging industry is, mm, it's not economically viable to do that. We could recycle that plastic bottle, but it's just not economically viable, so we're going to have to look at something else. That's the problem. Again, I have to say, I'm a scientist. I would love to be making programs about animal behavior. Instead, I'm now making programs about this, and as you can probably tell, I'm really angry about it. <laughs> but um, what really bugs me is that now I'm having to try and talk about economics in this, because what I've realized is that we will never be able to solve our environmental issues without dealing with the economic model and without dealing with is this infinite growth that apparently we think is the way forward and we, we, we deem as successful in life. But what I find really heartening, and this is where I find there is a, the real glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel, is that economists and business people are beginning to talk about the economic model not being fit for the 21st century. There's a wonderful woman called Kate Wayworth who wrote a book called Donut Economics, and she says, the 20th century business model said, how much financial value can I take out of this resource until I throw it away? But she says business leaders of the 21st century are asking a very different question. They're saying, how much but, uh, how, much be how many benefits can this, pro this product that I'm making here give to society 
but also give back to the natural world of which I am a part? How can it give back and support the natural world of which I am a part and on which I support from my very, on which I rely for my very survival? And how can all business sectors work together so that no new resources need to be taken out of the ground or out of the planet? So even if I'm a plastics industry and I have one waste product that I can't use, there must be another business sector out there that can use that. And so everything is circular, not only within the industry, but amongst all industries. And she calls it an, an ecosystem of resource use. So it's time definitely for us to continue making our voices heard, changing our plastic habits, but it's certainly also true that it's time for bold, innovative industry and policy leadership. And then, of course, for us consumers to support those people that are leading by example. It's time as a global community to act now as if our lives depended on it, because they do. And so I'll just finish with one last sentence. I know I've thrown a lot of information at you, but I hope that it's given you as much of a fire in your belly as it has in mine, and ask you, starting tomorrow, starting even this evening, to just do one thing differently. Pick one of the things I've mentioned, pick something else that you like the sound of, to show the planet you care, to be the change the planet needs. Because without all of us, each of us, doing our bit, we won't solve this. But I know that we can, especially now because the business sector is beginning to talk about it too. Thank you for bearing with me. I know it was a lot of information, but I hope you've, um, you've got something out of it. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone.